free speech zone is where we have to hold all of our events and that's why we held it here we're not allowed to do it anywhere on campus and that zone is from where we're standing now you can see the gate both a physical and metaphorical limit and ironically enough the limit is just past the no limit sign which i guess applies to everything at the university except for free speech We had a uh, free speech uh, demonstration uh, last year around early November and the reason we did this because there was a movement um, at University of Missouri and other universities where they wanted to set up you know, safe spaces where students could not express themselves and it was a direct violation of the First Amendment. So we really wanted to have this event to not only let people know you do have First Amendment rights on college, on college campuses, but to you know, have a dialogue with students about, hey, you know, what uh, speech is acceptable and what is not. So what we ultimately decided on was a tabling event where we would demonstrate, where we would repeat the speech of other groups that had been censored across the country and show students uh, just how silly it was to try and stop these kinds of messages. So before we or any other student organization here on campus can do anything and talk to students uh, on campus or do a tabling event of any kind, you have to go to administration to get permission. So we had to, ironically enough, go to a government official to request permission to do a free speech event. One of the crazy things about the University of South Carolina's free speech zone is that it imposes a delay uh, on when students can actually speak their minds in this designated area on campus. It's not enough just to limit you to one specific spot uh, on this campus. You actually have to wait for the privilege of using this spot on campus. Um, so as you can imagine, sometimes you know, this area fills up, and then if it fills up, you know, you're out of luck. But the other thing that's um, also ridiculous about their policy is you know, if you don't reserve a space, um, that even though even this place can be empty, and they can, they'll still say you, know, you can't come out here and you know, table or you know, do any kind of event. So Ross is smart. He knew that, well, you know, the speech was so controversial that it was censored on other campuses, Maybe, before I have this event, I should make sure that the authorities know about it just to make sure nothing goes wrong, that I'm not censored in any way when I'm talking about censorship. So he goes to an administrator and he explains all of the examples of censorship we'll be talking about, uh, which, by the way, are fire cases. A, uh, one that says Taco Tuesday, so a sorority in California was suspended for having a Taco Tuesday fundraiser. So we really try to show the message, hey, hey once you give universities the power, to decide you know, what's appropriate and what's not, they end up abusing that power to where cases where you know, stuff like this gets suspended. It was posted at our event by a Jewish student, because I'm a Jewish student. It was posted at George Washington University by a Jewish student. A Jewish student um, you know, displayed it and did a presentation on how it was originally a symbol for you know, peace and good luck. Uh, and we thought it was really important because the student who posted it wanted to talk about what the symbol meant and to try and reclaim the symbol. But it was a student who was, more, was very obviously trying to do good, trying to make the world a better place and getting shut down for it. The very next day, Ross receives a notice of charge from the assistant director of the Office of Equal Opportunity Programs at the university. The notice of charge says that three students have filed complaints against Ross because of the event. They allege that the signs and handouts and free speech wall contain speech that was so offensive to them that they think Ross should be uh, punished, that they think that his group should be defunded, that they're an illustration of, quote, how bigoted our student body could be, that they subjected other students to hate speech, that they could have incited a riot. Again, keep in mind that Ross is showing students examples in context of speech that have been censored elsewhere. The whole idea is that this speech should be protected. Nobody's going to come to a tabling event with a bunch of kids who say, hey, you want to talk about your First Amendment rights? That's not exciting. The idea was that people would see what we were doing, would come over and say, what are you doing here? And then we could explain it to them. There's probably, you know, a dozen people or so that, you know, came up to me and, you know, looked me straight in the eye and shook my hand and said, you know, thank you for what you're doing. Um, thanks for standing up for my rights, you know. So it really doesn't go unnoticed. And I think the, you know, majority of students who, um, came and talked to us, you know, stand up for free speech. We're a university of 30-something thousand students and 500 plus student organizations. And no two of those organizations, no two of those students agree on everything. And right now we have an environment uh, where students and faculty members all feel 
uh, that if you say something that somebody else disagrees with, you are going to have to or may have to answer for it. Uh, and that's a problem. It's a problem for the free exchange of ideas. It's a problem uh, for everything college is supposed to be, the marketplace of ideas. And that can't happen when people aren't free to speak their mind. My name's Ross Abbott. And my name's Michael Creedy. And we got in trouble for our free speech event. But with the help of FIRE, we're fighting back.